This is what the world population looks like mapped out over the countries. Some countries are more heavily populated than others, but overall, the entire world is full of people. If we now do the exact same thing for the number of scientific papers, and this is now in any discipline that come out of these countries, the picture is radically different. The vast majority of papers come from the global north. The global south contributes substantially less. For example, if you focus your eyes on Africa, the continent has almost disappeared. This gets even more dramatic if we look at Nobel Prizes. So clearly, this is using human capital around the globe in a terrible way. We're giving a very small number of people the tools to do the biggest research. What can we do to equalize this? Well, one very obvious route is you can throw lots of money at the problem. And presumably, that would go part way into addressing some of these issues. But in the famous words of Rutherford, we haven't got that money, so we'll have to think. So what can we do? So these kinds of experiments that I was showing you as an example, the reason they are so expensive is because you need to do two major things. One, you need to buy and calibrate a very expensive microscope. That's the thing on the left, two photon microscope. This will cost you something like $200,000. And then even once you have that microscope, you still need a sample to look at. So you need the ability to genetically manipulate model organisms. Now let's look at that second one first, genetic manipulation. If you go into a standard molecular biology lab, these are the sort of machines that you might find standing around. Each individual machine of those will cost a minimum of $1,000, many of them substantially more. So what do they do? Well, the first one is basically an oven. It's an incubator. The main job of this machine is to keep temperature and humidity at a certain level, and that is critical to keep whatever biological samples you have alive. Next guy, that's a centrifuge. Absolute key technique in, well, many sciences, allows you to separate samples using, by basically accelerating gravity, by spinning it. Here we've got a PCR machine, that's uh, basically a genetic material replication machine. Um, the way it works is you've got a bunch of different enzymes that work at different temperatures, and you go through cycles of going to different temperatures that are optimal for these different enzymes, and that will generate, well, will facilitate the replication of genetic material. So basically, it's a glorified heating and cooling device. The last thing here, that's an electrophoresis chamber. Again, this we use to separate samples, but now in a different context. And now we do it with electricity. You basically apply a current, you've charged particles, depending on the size and the charge of a particle, they will move at different speeds, and therefore you can separate them. So these kind of tools are absolutely everywhere when you go into a well-funded molecular biology lab. But if you think about the physics behind what these machines achieve, the physics has been solved for more than a century. This is not new stuff. This is the sort of stuff that surrounds our everyday lives we don't even think about anymore. So that being the case, can we maybe go to our garage and knock up some of these tools from scratch, just based on what we see flying around. I think we can. So this is an incubator, styrofoam box and a light bulb. It will give you a reasonably stable temperature. You can hatch your eggs. This will work. If you want to build a centrifuge, there's so many things out there that spin. You can use a bicycle wheel. You can use a fidget spinner. Many tools spin. Many tools spin fast enough to separate samples in a meaningful way. Similarly, if you need controlled heating and cooling, why not take a bunch of water baths and just take your sample and dip it iteratively through them? This is actually how this device was invented in the first place. If you want to zap, um, you could just take a lunchbox and batteries. 
it works just the same. Okay? So you can imagine that these kind of tools are much cheaper. Now, have we solved it? No, unfortunately not, because the problem with these tools is they're not particularly reproducible. Right? If I do my experiments with any one of those tools 20 times, chances are I'm going to get some different results over time. If I write this up in a paper and then you try to reproduce it, then presumably you're going to get different results because it's really hard to get those machines to be always the same, and that's critical in science. In comes the 3D printer. So this really has been the game changer. Because with a 3D printer, what I can do is I can design a very precise mechanical part, which I need for my scientific machine that I want to build. I can test it, and then once I'm satisfied that this is good, I can take this file, I can put it online, then you can download it, stick it in your 3D printer, and you get exactly the same part. That means that reproducing the mechanical aspects of these machines has become massively facilitated. And I should point out, to print anything on a 3D printer like this, it will cost you a fraction of a dollar. The material that you need for these printers is incredibly cheap. So here's an example of a 3D printer at work linked to a publication that we had a few years back where we drew attention to the possibilities of using 3D printers in this way. And one thing that we did, just to make the point how this is possible, is we showcased a 3D printed pipette. Now, pipette is an absolute corner piece in any molecular biology lab. It allows you to sa transfer samples uh, uh, of, of whatever material you need to be transferring. So we put this 3D printed pipette in there. It was a reasonably good pipette, but it wasn't yet up to the standard that you might find in a commercial one. But critically, we put the plans of this pipette up, and I should point out that we didn't invent this pipette. I saw a different pipette online. We modified it, and we put this one forward. So then we put ours forward, and then others saw this pipette, and they say, hey, this is great, but you did this part really stupidly. You should change this bit. And the beautiful thing about that is they didn't need to tell us that. They could just take the design, change that bit, publish their own pipette, say, look, these guys' pipette is this good, mine is better. And then the next guy comes along and says, OK, this pipette is great, but I can make it better still. So today, when you look around, when you go on a search engine and you put 3D printed pipette, you will find lots of different versions, and lots of different quality grades. Here's a few of them displayed. We come to a point when it's not even that easy anymore to tell apart which one is the commercial one. Um, it's the second from the right in this case. And actually, some of these pipettes are now meeting ISO standards for accuracy. So this is critical. So this is the standard that you would need if you wanted to commercialize this pipette. You could sell this, and it would, it would fly. Right? Similarly, you can say, I did my experiment using these pipettes, and then people wouldn't really have grounds to complain that you used subpar equipment. Right? So some of these tools are really coming along, and they're becoming very powerful. This is another context that may have come across in terms of 3D printing. This is people designing mechanical parts that can replace limbs. So for example, if someone loses a hand, you can 3D print this thing. And the fingers, in this case, are connected with strings. If you pull on the, on the string, the finger contracts. So it's a sort of primitive prosthesis. You can imagine if you combine that with a motor and maybe a muscle electrode, you can get the person to actually control the movement in this hand. And again, very cheap to build. So this is sort of where we can push the 3D printing at the moment with these kind of filaments. The problem, however, is you can print as much of a brain as you want. It's never going to start thinking for you. So really, instead, what we need is we need to combine these 3D printing possibilities with uh, consumer-oriented uh, oriented electronics. Things like this guy, this is a microcontroller. It's basically a device that allows you to connect your computer to a piece of electronics. In a simple way, you could say maybe I press a button on my computer and then a light switch is on. Or I will have a sensor connected to this thing. The sensor senses something and sends uh, the signal to a different electronic piece to maybe open, open a door or something. So with these kind of little mini brains, if you combine them with the 3D printed, now we're talking business. So here is uh, one of the possibly silliest things you can do with this. 
you may have come across this. It's a, it's a so-called useless box. Um, you switch it on, and the sole purpose in life of this box is to switch itself off again. So you can do that, or you can do something useful. Um, so we've tried, we've tried to stay on the useful side. So here is a proof of principle that we've tried to come up with, combining 3D printing and cheap electronics. And this was very much inspired by the $100 laptop idea that you may have come across some years ago. This is the $100 lab. So this is basically a 3D printed platform for microscopy. It's a fluorescence microscope. Um, it also has some additional capabilities, um, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and really, this was a proof of principle that for 100 euros, you could build a machine that could really meaningfully contribute to the research going on in a, moder in a, in a modern lab, even the lab that's well-funded already. So just some examples of what you can do with this. So here you see our friend the zebrafish again. Two examples. Uh, see if, oh yeah, here's the video. So on the right, what we can see there is this is the zebrafish, transparent as I pointed out. And the thing that's moving, that's the heart. So this heart is expressing a fluorescent protein, and it lets us visualize the contractions of the two chambers. It's a fish, so it's got two, not four. Um, and you can imagine this becomes immediately useful if you, for example, want to study circulatory function. Um, oops, OK, the other video didn't uh, play. So um, we're absolutely not alone in generating these tools. This is a, a global effort. It's a huge community, and it's a very rapidly growing community. And this community meets at conferences, they meet online, and they discuss ideas, they discuss what are the standards that we need to set, what are the projects that need addressing. Um, and this uh, has started to get the attention of a lot of media over the last years. So here's one, one coverage that we had recently from one of those conferences, um, basically reporting on the idea that people are coming together to build low-cost, open hardware scientific tools. Now, all this time I was talking about this molecular biology aspect, but what about the other half, the two-photon microscope? Well, the same principle applies. Even though this is a very complicated machine, these sort of machines are fundamentally modular. That means that I can take one module, where maybe I have an idea of how to improve it, how to make it cheaper, I improve it, I publish this, I put it into my microscope, and I've saved maybe 5% of the costs. And then someone else comes along and thinks, oh, maybe this module, I can change it. I take it, I modify it, put it back, and we've saved another 5%. So if we keep doing this, we can really push down the cost of these kind of microscopes. So already now, if you go for an open hardware approach to building one of those, uh, we've slashed the cost by more than 50%, and this trajectory is going down rapidly. Also, you should take these things with a little bit of a pinch of salt, because two photo microscopes don't look like the thing I showed. This is what it actually looks like in our lab. And I just want to highlight a few things. We improvise a lot. So ours are basically held together by hope and tape. So we've got tape, we've got LED strips, we've got putty, we've got a soda can. Turns out that's really good for electrical shielding. So we're really we're combining the low-cost and the high-cost approaches in the lab. And this is actually the microscope that generated the picture I showed you in the beginning. So, maybe instead of using money, we can use an open hardware approach. And just in closing, I want to highlight that it's, it's nice to stick these things online, but you really you need to get people to actively search uh, out these possibilities and to learn about these possibilities. And to do this in particular with the focus in Africa, colleagues and I founded this organization Trend in Africa. We've got projects in more than 20 countries by now. There are lots of different types of projects, ranging from community engagement, we've got volunteering programs. And one of those things is promoting open hardware. And what we do there concretely is we go to our African partner universities and we get students and we show them, look, this is a 3D printer. This is a microcontroller. This is where you can find information online. We do a crash course in these kind of things, and we encourage them to build the scientific tools that they need for their own research. So in this case, for example, here they built a behavioral chamber for rodents. This thing is published. You can look it up, 
and you can build it yourself in your lab. So now we've come around full circle, where now the global south can generate the scientific tools that maybe the rest of the world needs. So in closing, I want to change a little bit this Mandela quote. It's very famous. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Well, I think it needs a twist. I think it's education to help yourself. Thank you.